More than 5,000 houses have been destroyed by bushfire over the last 30 years. Around Australia, there are more than half a million houses built within 100 metres of large areas of bushland. What have we learnt since the Black Saturday bushfires? And how has it changed the way we build our houses? If anyone should have the answers, it's Justin Leonard. He's surveyed the aftermath of every major bushfire since the Canberra firestorm of 2003. Understanding how those fires interact with things we deal with in a daily life is, um, is a, f a fascinating uh, uh, frontier to be pushing. What's the rule of thumb for fire safety between bushland and a house? Well, typically we see around 80 or 90 per cent of house loss within the first 100 metres. Well, what's alarming is that we're noticing that with more and more severe fire weather events occurring, we're actually finding that that distance extends. Statistics show that separating houses from bushland by at least 700 metres removes most of the risk. But for many, that defeats the purpose of living in the bush. What we like to provide is design solutions, simple design solutions that help people build within that 700 metres or so. Justin and his team have spent years testing the flammability of materials in the lab. Now they're preparing to put an entire steel frame house to the ultimate test. We're looking to burn a complete house in a, in a real bushfire burnover simulation in a facility that's more or less one of a kind in the world. And this is the first time we've really had a chance to test a complete house as a whole system. But before the real test can begin, they need careful preparation and just the right weather conditions. The test simulates the worst case bushfire event that could possibly be dealt out to, in fact, any house in a bushfire in Australia. At the heart of the experiment is a grid of gas burners fuelled by liquid propane, designed to recreate the same temperature and behaviour as bushfire flames. It's particularly exciting to have a fire that we can adjust and observe. It's almost a fire in captivity. The house has been built by the National Association of Steel Framed Housing, which also commissioned the research. After the Black Saturday bushfires, we looked at how steel could be used to produce safer structures for people in houses. And this has resulted in this building being built here and the test that's about to happen. And key to that is how steel performs under fire. The idea is to build a fire resistant structure using conventional and cheap materials available to anyone. Lyndon McIndoe's job is to wire up the house for the flame test. Well, I love what you've done with the place. Yes, yeah, not too bad. It's got a few holes in it and that. We've instrumented the whole house. We've put 100 thermocouples, similar to these ones here, they're measuring the inside temperature. They spread throughout the house. We've also got six radiometers that measure the heat being applied to the house. So you're getting real-time data as the, as the flame test progresses? Yeah, that's right. And we use the real-time data to monitor how the house is performing during the test and also to control the burners at the front, yeah. As an audience gathers from the local firefighting community, the finishing touches are put to the house to make the test as realistic as possible. Five minutes to test. How are you feeling now? Quietly confident, but slightly nervous. Are you a bit like an expectant parent? At the moment? Yes, a bit, yes. After weeks of waiting, the wind swings in just the right direction. OK, we've got final purging of the grid before test. If the house can survive the radiant heat to come, it can survive anything. Aiming for three kilowatts. In three, two, one, ignition. We start the radiation at a level of two kilowatts per metre squared. So that's more or less the point that someone would have to be, or be forced to take shelter within the house. Right at two. The intensity increases steadily for 30 minutes, like a bushfire front approaching the house. Five kilowatts. And we're starting to get to the rapid advancing stage of the radiation curve. That builds up to a crescendo of something like 40 kilowatts, which is the level of radiant heat you would have when the flames are actually imminent or licking against the house itself. OK, let's bring in underburner and main flame.
This is what happens when a house is surrounded by burning bushland. It's engulfed by a terrifying wall of flame. Now the rear of the house is under attack as well. Well, it is the worst case theoretical time that you could possibly immerse a house in solid flame. Usually a fire front takes 30 or 40 seconds to pass. For two minutes, this house has to withstand temperatures up to 1,200 degrees. A fire-resistant house is only as good as its weakest point. First the window fails, and then the door burns through. Now things get ugly. As the house fills with hot smoke, the temperature inside leaps to more than 200 degrees. Okay, main off. As the flames die down, Justin surveys the aftermath of the bushfire of his own making. So this door would be a weak link? Definitely a weak link in the process of you. Simply a combination of a timber solid core door and a steel frame isn't, isn't an adequate combination in flame zone. So we can see quite a considerable thermal layering effect and it seems to be uh, smoke and combustion products that have come from the door and the far window. There doesn't seem to be a strong indication that a lot of heat's come through the wall itself. Ken feels the test has vindicated steel frames. Commonly people say that either steel melts or it buckles. Uh, obviously the steel hasn't melted and uh, while the outer cladding is buckled, the inner frame is still in quite good condition. So you've busted that myth, you reckon? Oh, I think so, yes. All in all, it looks like the structure is quite a sound um, conceptual approach and it just needs some tinkering around the edges to really make sure it's going to survive really well. If you're inside, could you have survived that test? Um, because there was a breach in the window and a breach in the door, the amount of combustible elements that would have penetrated would have made the rooms that they breached into quite untenable almost immediately. The next day, after everything has cooled down, the team takes the cladding off to discover that not all materials were up to the task. There you go, there's the answer. Yeah. Melted glass insulation. The failure of the insulation may have affected the steel frame. Uh, that's a local buckle in the steelwork. When it got very hot, it got up to about 1,000 degrees C. That would have to be replaced. The behaviour of the flames could lead to a change in the building codes. The flames that did reach the back rolled back and impacted the back of the house, which was certainly a surprise for us. This strongly suggests that we need to regulate the whole house to the same level of exposure when we're talking about flame attack. So what have we learned? Well, the house is still standing, but you wouldn't really want to live in it. Until we see the data, we won't know exactly if people could have survived in it. But one thing is clear. The distance you put between yourself and bushland is crucial, so your house never has to endure flames like this. It certainly changed my view of bushfires. Designing the bushfire profile theoretically on paper was one thing, but seeing and feeling it here in the test in full scale was uh, certainly uh, an evolution in the way I think about bushfires.